Hey, welcome back to the Feral North devlog. It's been four months since the last entry, which is way too long, so let's get right back into it. We've now got coups, snow, and loads of new content. But as I've been putting the game world together, it's gotten pretty big. Here's the entire demo area, and here's the rest of the game world. It's quite a bit bigger. There are no loading screens and no camera cuts once you're in the game, and for a while it was fine to just keep the whole world loaded at all times, but now it's getting to be a bit of a problem. Ram is skyrocketing with 9 terrains, 2500 rocks, and 6.7 million quads of grass in the game. I know because, well I counted. That's a lot of grass. So we need to fix this. Since Feral North is set in an archipelago, it's easy to start by defining each island as a zone, with the ocean as another zone in between. This simple system lets me disable the zones you're not in or adjacent to, which saves CPU and GPU resources, so it's a good starting point, but all that data still takes up a lot of memory. The new islands are much, much larger than the demo island, so I need a way to break them down into smaller segments. There's really no sense in having this coup and his luscious orange locks loaded while you're a kilometer away, even if you are on the same island. It's also quite manual defining these zones, especially since objects span multiple. This manual control has benefits for some special cases, but most of the time, I'd prefer a much more automated system. So let's make it happen. The goal is to implement something called world streaming, breaking the world into smaller segments and asynchronously streaming them in and out of memory as needed. There are some assets available for this, but there's a lot of room for optimization with a custom solution, so that's the plan. I started by breaking a few areas down into their own scene files, and now we need a way to decide when each of these scenes should be streamed in or out. A common solution is to place sensors strategically throughout the world, or use sequences like elevators and doors. That's a lot of effort, and it doesn't really work for Feral North because you can canoe around every island. Besides, there aren't any elevators in the highlands. I'd also like the flexibility to rearrange the world without having to keep track of all these little sensors. Instead, I ended up writing an editor tool to calculate a bounding box around the contents of a scene. I do this in the editor for every subscene, so at runtime there is nothing left to calculate, all the heavy lifting is pre-cached. Next I wrote an update loop on my world zone manager, which checks one subscene per frame, round robin style, and checks if the bounds of that scene are in or out of the camera's far clip range. Add a really small buffer when checking if we're in range, just so there's some time to load the scene before it becomes visible, and a slightly larger buffer when checking if we're out of range. That way we don't go crazy loading and unloading scenes, which would just cause a lot of garbage. They're asynchronously streamed, but it's not free after all, so we really don't want to unload a scene until we know for sure it's no longer needed. I mentioned before the old system with pre-designated zones still had some special uses, so I didn't want to lose that. I ended up writing a sort of combination, where each zone has two flags. One indicates if it should be streamed in, and one indicates if it's been activated by any kind of gameplay trigger. If either of these is true, the subscene is loaded, otherwise it's unloaded. I also specify which zones it's valid to stream from. If you're on Island 1, there's really no point checking if Island 6 should be streamed because it's never going to be true. I also may want to load in an imposter for nearby zones, for instance an imposter island 2 when you're on island 1, so the eligible zones to stream from gives me a lot of flexibility. So with all this working, I started making more and more and more and more of these subscenes. Seriously, this took a really long time, going through every game object one by one and assigning it to a subscene, and by the end I was at 66 subscenes and I'll be well over 100 soon as I break down more islands. And all this gave me time to ponder, and as I pondered, I pondered up an idea to automate this. I used to do a little bit of machine learning in my day job, and I remembered a handy little algorithm for clustering called k-nearest neighbors. It takes an arbitrary dataset and groups it into however many clusters you want, defined by k, based on how near the data points are to one another. So I thought, why not simply represent each game object as its 3D position, and run the k-nearest neighbors algorithm on a selected group of game objects, specifying how many subgroups or subscenes to break them into, and just generate all the subscenes. So I whipped up a k-nearest neighbors implementation, and it actually worked really well. But I immediately scrapped it. The problem became obvious when I tried to name the generated subscenes. They had physical proximity in common, but there's no real logical grouping. I much preferred my manual results where each subscene could be easily referenced, for instance as Island 4 Path from Waterfall to Cave, or Island 1 Beach, for example. It just makes it much easier for me to keep track of them, especially when I want to add another rock and I need to figure out which subscene it's going to belong to. I could just have all the subscenes be arbitrary and random, but again, I gain a lot of flexibility with the system I'm building, so I figure it's much easier for me to make use of that when the segments have some reasoning behind them. It's much more useful to have a cave broken into an entrance, exit, and inside than to have it split on an arbitrary line down the middle. So I continued working away and I manually made all 66 subscenes, and with streaming implemented, it was finally time to get back to making some actual content. Except, as soon as I got back to content creation, I realized I really need a way to stream in the editor so I can reliably see the world as it's going to look in-game while I work on it. So I made a few small tweaks to run streaming in the editor, adding a third bit to the zone activation logic to indicate if a zone is needed for an editor task, like baking lights or the nav mesh. This way, whenever a bake operation starts, it can just set this flag to ensure that it's not going to be unloaded mid-operation. 
Then I could finally get back to work on content creation. Except, I'd really like a way to see what's happening as I play the game. So I added a debug window to show the current zone states. This is helpful to understand how well the system's working and where there's room for improvement. Wait, why did that scene just unload and reload a few seconds later? The debug window helped a ton with tuning the buffers for loading and unloading. In particular, I found I needed to look for situations where it would unload a scene and then reload it a few seconds later if the level design had you walk around a long bend, for example. Okay, finally back to work on the game and... What the heck, why does the game keep stuttering? Each time a subscene streams in, the game starters pretty hard. The net result is basically lower memory usage and better performance on average, with occasional harsh and really unacceptable stutters mixed in. The problem is that even though all the data and assets are being loaded asynchronously from the disk, once they're ready to actually be activated, Unity's main thread needs to run all the awake and unenable functions for every component being loaded in, all in one frame. So that one frame is really slow, as much as 5 to 10 times longer than the usual frame, even for a small 1 megabyte scene file. Us Unity devs love to fill our awake functions with those get component calls, but you know how you should never use get component in update loops because it's so slow? Well, those subscene awake functions end up having the same effect as a slow update, because they run mid game as a subscene is streamed in. So I needed a way to get rid of all those slow awake functions and yet still have the component references. I could manually drag and drop the references in the editor, but that's really error prone and honestly just an annoying way to work. Plus, I never actually trust Unity to remember these references, they have an awful tendency to get forgotten. If I lost all references across all scene files and had to manually reassign them all, I'd probably cry. So let's avoid that. Once again, I want something that's automated, and more specifically, I want something that's determinate, meaning the results are always consistent, so if Unity ever forgets a reference, it'll just automatically get reassigned. What I came up with was a little dependency injection attribute where each component reference gets tagged with a location specifying where to find it. These just match up to the various get component functions, but what's special is I analyze the tags in the onValidate function, only in the editor, and serialize the results. When the game starts up, or a subscene loads, references are already there, there's no wake function to slow things down, and as a bonus, the initial game load is a bit faster as well. If any reference is ever lost, it just gets immediately overwritten with the correct value. With this, there's no more stutter, no more awake functions, and to me, it's just a much cleaner way to define references. It's a pretty solid little system, so I've open sourced it, you can find the GitHub link down below, feel free to use it in your own project, and as a bonus, it even actually works on interfaces, which is something you can't do by default in Unity. All in all, I'm finding the whole streaming system works really well with my workflow, and it's something I'll likely incorporate from day one of my next game. The editor is also much snappier than before when the entire game was one massive scene file, and I'm keeping the subscenes really tight, they're easy to reason about, and the memory footprint is kept in check. Girl North now runs on less than 1.2 gigs of RAM on high quality with mostly 2K textures, which gives me a lot of room to add more and more decor to the world and upscale some of the more important textures on higher quality settings. Speaking of, I made sure to tie the streaming to the quality settings, so on lower quality, the far clip distance is decreased on the camera, and streaming takes this into account. Even after all that, there are still a couple issues though. One being that occlusion isn't considered. Since we're only checking the distance of the camera, you may be playing in this field, but because this lighthouse is technically in range, it needs to get streamed into memory, even though there's a mountain between you and it's never going to be visible. The usual frustum and occlusion culling still ensures nothing's drawn, but it's wasting CPU cycles calculating all that. I do have a few ideas on how to solve this by calculating occlusion groups on the scene bounding boxes, but for now it's something I can totally live with and just solve a lot of these scenarios with a combination of streaming and gameplay triggers. Maybe an item for future enhancement though. The other is more specific to Feral North, and that's that I can only place items into subscenes as long as they don't require saving or loading data. Anything requiring persistence needs to stay in the main scene for now, but they'll still be disabled using the original gameplay trigger bit when you're out of the zone, just as they used to be. This is really just a limitation of the way I wrote the game save system, and the fact that persistence components live on the same prefabs as the visuals. It's fixable, but it's a bit of work to make that happen. Aside from these two issues, with all this in place, Feral North is not only able to run on memory restricted hardware, but there's a lot of room to add more and more details to the game. Most importantly, my software developer brain just sleeps a little bit better at night knowing there's a little less memory going to waste.